Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming out on this sunny morning. My name's Rosemary Milsom, and I'm the director of the Newcastle Writers' Festival. Thank you. And look, you know, to be honest, there has to be some perks to this job. <laughs> really. I, I, hand on my heart, I did try to get a couple of other facilitators. <laughs> And uh, they just couldn't, they I couldn't make it. I thought you were going to say other guests. <laughs> <laughs> I tried that too. <laughs> I'm very pleased to be hosting this conversation with actor, artist, director. And more recently, he's added children's book writer to his lengthy CV with his uh, book, Artie and the Grime Wave. Welcome to Newcastle, Richard Roxburgh. Thank you, Rose Mean. Hello, guys. <laughs> Uh, I, I actually think um, I could have programmed a whole rake theme <laughs> in this festival. It, it, you could actually have a festival of rake. I have no doubt whatsoever. Quite a good idea. <laughs> uh, you've just, I've welcomed you to Newcastle, but you've just come back from New York. I should welcome you back from New York. Yes. How was it? What were you doing? Uh, we were doing a production, a, 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 an adaptation of a Chekhov called The Present that we'd done it. Sydney Theatre Company the year before, oh, last year, uh, was it? It was 18 months ago, anyway. Yeah, <laughs> and, with Kate um, Blanchett. Yeah, with Kate mm. uh, Blanchett, and, um, and so we took that to, to Broadway. So it was kind of four months uh, on Broadway, which sounds fabulous, and it was, but it was kind of deep midwinter, which is mm. kind of... And they've had a tough winter. Yeah. I think it's still snowing. It was snowing up till a couple of weeks ago. It's still snowing, and Donald Trump is the president, so it was an <laughs> eerie kind of <laughs> weird uh, environment. And you, I was just saying, you, I noticed on Instagram, Sylvia, your lovely wife, had put a picture up of Raph, your son who's sitting side of stage, <coughs> flying back to New York, and, uh, and I was curious about why he flew back. Because uh, they came back, didn't they, after some period there with yeah. you? Yeah. So my family came out for the school holidays, which was great, you know. Um, <laughs> but it was kind of hilarious as well because everybody got sick. Um, so there was this kind of... We spent Christmas Day at the Presbyterian Hospital. And, uh, I think three out of the five last Christmases have been spent at outpatients <laughs> somewhere <laughs> on the planet Earth. <laughs> um, so it was one of those kind of revolving doors of lunacy where everything went wrong. Um, but yeah, we brought my boy back because I was kind of, I mean, two months without my family's too long. Mm. So um, we flew him as an unaccompanied minor, uh, which was great. Um, <laughs> and um, no, we were just talking before because yeah. it's actually great because if you fly your kids, you can pay $90 to fly them as an unaccompanied minor, and they get treated like royalty by Qantas, you know, because they have to have an empty seat next to them, so they're basically in business class, and they get escorted through customs by, you know, so they go to the front of the queue, they get, and, the, you know, it's fabulous. Mm. So Rosemary did have an idea that she should sort of fly ahead with her husband business class the next holiday and, and send then get the kids, the kids sent over <laughs> the next day. And a company. 90 bucks. It's great. <laughs> I mean, that's money well spent. I'm interested <laughs> in um, the, the notion of audiences. I saw you in the play in present in, at the Sydney Theatre Company. And is there a different audience geographically? So do New York audiences react Oh, it was very different. Yeah, it was very different. Um, it was quite... See, in Sydney... I, I, OK, let me explain briefly. It was a, so it's, a, it's Chekhov's great unfinished mess of a play called Platonov, which he wrote when I think he was 18 years old. And then he, he gave it to an actress, the famous actress of the day in Moscow, who, who didn't want to do it. And so he was stricken with shame and he put it in the sock drawer for the rest of his life. And they only discovered it um, uh, after he died, like 20 years after he died. And you can't do it as it is, you have to adapt it. So they did, so uh, Andrew Upton ad has adapted it and we set it in post-perestroika Russia in the 1990s. So... It's quite, it's quite funny, it's, it's very, very funny. Very it's funny. quite far they're farcical actually. Yeah, yeah. And seeing Kate Blanchett Sm pretending to be smashed and, you know, like hum yeah. dry humping. Thing. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, it, it was, was funny. Sh she's funny. Oh, she's hilarious. I mean, she's a great clown. Kate's, and she's daring. Like, yeah. she'll do stuff on stage that, you know, is just very, very daring. Um, 
So it was a lot of fun to do, and but it wasn't controversial, you know. It was just mm. kind of, well, we've adapted it. This is what we've done. But you do that in New York, and you realise, wow, uh, it was very controversial. So probably the whole front row would have been PhD students who'd well, written about that play, or was it? Was it? That well, no. It's more. It's more that you know. You realise that this is an audience that has been inculcated in kind of musicals and mm. Arthur Miller plays and well-made, you know, restorations of works that, you know, that you see over time. And they're beautiful plays, don't get me wrong, you know, Arthur Miller and Tennessee Williams, but you realise that for, you know, you could practically hear them kind of trying to process this whole thing of, well, where am I? I mean, is, you know, am, are we in... Australia, what, you know, what, is there, are they Russians? Are they Russians here? Uh, you know, you can feel the cogs, kind of the mechanics of it. It was problematic. Uh, for, um, but then, there, of course, there were many who, who loved it, you know, because mm. New York's, a, you know, it's a very erudite city. Uh, they were clinically depressed, though, New York as well at the time <laughs> because of what was happening. Um, and you were telling me that you had a hundred bucks on Trump winning. I did. A long time ago when he first announced. As soon as he announced that he was running as a Republican nominee, I said to my mate, he is going to be the president. And then, of course, I thought that was, I, and we bet a hundred dollars on it. And then, of course, I thought, you know, as the polls, as it was polling, I thought, well, that's a hundred dollars I've, I've lost. And I've, I was never happier to lose a hundred dollars in my life. But... <laughs> Um, yeah, you know, it's the, disenf it's the disenfranchised. It's the so the family, you took the family to New York and, and Raph's sitting off stage. What, mm. what do you, on Hopefully. your iPhone, yeah. what do, um, <laughs> what, what do um, your kids make of what you do as an actor? What, what, what is their sense of oh, they this, this job you do? Well, I, I, I mean, he loves it. He, ca he, he came on stage, uh, on stage. <laughs> he came to the theatre with me every single moment in New really? York. And we were in a beautiful theatre. It was sort of similar, a sort of similar vintage and style of theatre to this, the, the Ethel Barrymore Theatre in New York, and he loved it. He came literally every day. Uh, so when I had a double bill day, like a Wednesdays and Saturdays, he would spend all the time in the theatre with me. Um, so they kind of, I think they love it. Mm. Um, I mean, Rafi definitely loves it. Miro's, you know, six years old, so it's sort of hard to tell what he makes of it. Um, how, how has fatherhood uh, affected you? And I, I mean, it ties in, I suppose, with, with yeah. the writing of the book. How, how has it changed you? And you're about to become a father for the third time. Yes, yes, we just keep going. I know. I, mean, and I, we'll I was so worried because Sylvia's due in a couple of weeks, isn't yes, she? And she I was is. thinking, oh, no, that baby better not come early. <laughs> <laughs> There'll be a riot in Newcastle. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, look, it's, I mean, it changes everything. It changes everything because it has to, but it also changes everything because it's changed. I guess it changed me. It it it, it makes you. Um, I think it made me a lot sort of safer person, probably. So it, you know, there are a lot of a lot of ways of being that I had that I was kind of, you know, that I'd attached to to my life in what I did. That, I, that were not very safe, I don't think. So spending lots of time overseas and going around, you know, and spending time, long times in hotels and foreign quarters, going out with sort of English actors and getting wildly drunk and <laughs> dangerous. And so I think it's, I think it's just, you know, it's, it's better. You mm. find a lot of love that you never knew was there uh, and a lot of fun. Um, so, yeah, no, I, I've, it's... It's the best thing ever. What made you want to act in the beginning? Because you started off at university studying something completely different. Yes, yes, I did. Um, I did a, uh, uh, a production in the Albury Civic Theatre when I was 16 years old of Death of a Salesman um, and played Willie Loman in it. And uh, As a 16 year as old. As a 16 year old. And yeah. <laughs> My mate Nick Megalarkis, who was a Greek boy with an afro, uh, <laughs> played my son Biff. And <laughs> <laughs> if only there was kind of video of that production. I'm sure there probably. Thank is goodness, somewhere. Facebook didn't exist in those days. <laughs> but um, I had one of those moments that you 
that you, you know, that, that uh, just struck me to the core because I was, you know, I suddenly was that character um, hurling a chair across a room and cursing my sons and I felt something really, I, I can remember the moment. So something happened mm. and it just grabbed me. Because, yes, I mean, I was, you know, I grew up the youngest of six kids on the, on the highway in Albury Wodonga, and, and um, um, there was no format for me. There was no sort of template. All my brothers and sisters, and we're all very close, but they're all, they're all sort of scientists of various descriptions, really. So... So you're the black sheep in, yeah, in that sense of yes. going off on a tangent, which is kind of what Michael Lunig talked about that. Did he? Yeah, he, he said to me that when he grew up, you know, there's this expectation. You, his father was um, uh, worked in a slaughterhouse and, you know, working oh. class, that you would be yeah. that. That's what you would be, and he didn't want to be that. And so he's always felt it was a struggle to be able to go off on that creative sort of path. From his parents. Yeah. Like, no, and that... you will work in a slaughterhouse. <laughs> right. But I want to, no, no, put the pen down. <laughs> Get to the slaughterhouse. <laughs> I mean, thank goodness. He, you didn't have that? Is, yeah. No, I didn't have that at all. I, I, um, no, my, my parents, they, what they were determined to do, and, you know, my mother was so determined that we all have tertiary education because at least then you would have a choice. You know, God mm. bless her. Um, so... Uh, yeah, so she was, you know, she was strict in that way, but, but once I, once it became, you know, patently clear that at university I was a kind of drunken loon and a failure <laughs> as an economics student, uh, <laughs> it for me, that was my slaughterhouse. I just, it's like, I can't go back into that, no more macroeconomic theory for me. Um, so... My mother, would, they, although I did finish the degree, I have to say, so I am actually an, an economist. But, but yeah, my, my mum <laughs> my mum and dad were very, you know, once I said, look, I really want to go and mm. try for drama school, they were fine. They, and then they loved it. They loved it when I found something that I actually was passionate about. Can you remember your first paid gig as an actor? Yes, it was... Um, a play called On Parliament Hill that Robin Archer directed at Belvoir Street uh, with Geoffrey Rush playing a corpse. Uh, <laughs> and <laughs> it, was, it was actually a really great play. It was set in um, London and it was about this sort of gay couple who found one another as, as older gentlemen. And it was Reese McConaughey and, and Bob Horner. It was a beautiful company of players. Um, so yeah, I can remember the thrill of getting my first paycheck. I can also remember there was a moment when I, I had to lie down. I was playing a skinhead, very sort of resentful skinhead, angry. I think all skinheads are resentful. Yeah, a lot of rage. And <laughs> so there were, I had to go to sleep at this one moment on the stage and there were floorboards with little cracks in between them on a rake like that. And so I was sort of lying there for probably 10 minutes. And Jeffrey was playing a corpse, and he would poke his head up every now and then and sort of comment on what was happening on stage. <laughs> and, um, and Jeffrey and Paul Blackwell were corpses. And at a certain point, I would, so I would lie down, and at a certain point, probably about 30 seconds after I'd <laughs> I lay down, I'd feel this wet finger. <laughs> start to creep <laughs> up into my ear and <laughs> it would stay there <laughs> and I have never felt so intruded <laughs> uh, in my entire life. There is nothing so intrusive as a moistened Jeffrey Rush finger, I'll tell you <laughs> that much for free. I want to take you back to 2010, not that long ago. Mm. To Hugo Weaving playing the role of Professor Graham Murray, and uh, he's charged with cannibalism. Um, and his barrister is this kind of kind hearted, self destructive uh, man, Cleaver Green. And I remember watching the episode, I was uh, a friend of mine's TV writer, and he said, Oh, you've got to watch this because they you know, get preview copies before mm. it airs. And uh, I thought, Okay, you know, I didn't really know much about it. He said, You'll love it. And I put it on, and I 
a glass of wine and I was watching it and I sort of was snorting wine. I was just like, <laughs> it was just, it was, it was so, there was nothing quite like it and it, it was just hilarious and farcical and this, this sort of shambolic cleaver green. Um, were, were you worried about how it was going to be received? Because it is quite a unique, mm. he's a unique character, it's a unique show. Were you worried at, before it went to air of how it would be received? Um, I don't really remember. I'm talking being, about Rake, obviously. Yeah, yes. I don't remember being worried. I mean, I, I, I suppose we would have been. Um, uh, yeah, look, I guess before something comes out, you think, you know, you have, you have your hope. I mean, especially because it was a passion project. It was a project, that, you know, because that was a kind of character that I'd been talking to my mate Peter Duncan about for mm. a long, long time, trying to get him to write essentially this, this character that was largely drawn from a mate of mine at university who was an incredibly self-destructive, very brilliant man. And I'd always been saying, can, you, can we do this? And, and finally, once he settled on the idea of the character being a lawyer, he got excited about it because um, he was a former lawyer himself. And lawyers love all of that. And, mm. you know, former lawyers love all that. Lawyery stuff. Lawyery stuff. stuff. <laughs> and so I thought, great, well, let's... Great, and I did love the sort of tension between the idea of him having to perform as a functioning, brilliant lawyer mm. on that side of the law, but being like this and so bent and damaged in, in so many other ways on the other side. So yeah, it was a passion project. So we, I guess we were, you know, we were hoping that it would, that it would work out, uh, and you never really know. Mm. But in another way, you have to just do it because you love it. Um, because there's no other reason to do things. And, and that's been my sort of North Star, really, for the way I've run things for quite a long time now. Did you... Um, the writing's brilliant. I mean, the mm. writing is so good. Did you anticipate that it would be so long... I mean, you know, going into another series... Well, we can say that later, but I hope there's another series. Um, <laughs> did you think it would have that momentum, that, that it would continue? I know you had a break and you, you've returned. Yeah. Did you just see beyond that first series at all? Oh, not really. I mean, not when you do the first series, you sort of think, well, we'll just do a series of this and, and you have to see how it goes, obviously, if it gets traction. Um, so after the second series, I guess, you know, we started to think, well, they, they like it, the ABC likes it, and, and p people seem to like it. And, and I, I mean, I've been in particular, been particularly proud of the last two seasons because I think these things take time to, you, you know, you, you just find a sweet spot and you, mm. you work out more stuff as you go along. You work out shorthand between one another about what works and what mm. doesn't work and you get better at saying to one another... Um, no, that doesn't... Yeah. I don't think that's going to work. Yeah, or... yeah, and you, you accept it and you go, OK, well, I'm fine if you think that. Mm. And so... Um, the last two seasons, I've I've really thought we kind of hit the sweet spot as well because there were there was a lot more um, spontaneity in the performance, so there was a mm. lot more imp improvising going on. Why which... do you think people love Cleaver so much? Um, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I, I think um, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, look, I think he's, look, he's, he's a hilarious, you know, he's a complete fool of a man who, who, who um, is so delusional about stuff <laughs> and is so flawed on so many <laughs> levels. And yet, it, it, when you crack it all apart, you realise there actually is the kind of there are the mechanics of a really thoroughly decent, mm. lovable human being. There's a good there. heart. Yeah, somewhere he has in a there. Good heart in there. Uh, in there, yeah. Yes. But it's just all the mess, the, yeah. the layers of <laughs> garbage that have been that have stuck to him over time. Um, you know, like pig pen. He's completely kind of covered in the detritus of of this life lived very badly. Um, so. Yeah, I, I guess it's just people like, you know, uh, people like seeing flawed characters and um, coming undone. And I think possibly women view, view Rake in a different way to the way that yeah, men do. Yeah, so I'm sure if we did a survey of the audience, <laughs> yeah, it's going to be 90% women. <laughs> uh, there's just something about him. Women yeah, love I, him. Well, uh, but I think they also, r women probably love seeing things go really badly wrong for <laughs> somebody like that. <laughs> 
um, <laughs> who thinks he's just such a kind of pants master. <laughs> um, women love seeing things go, you know, him ending up having to live with five women, including <laughs> his, you know, including a former mother-in-law and what have you, so, yeah. Do you have a favourite episode so far that, um, that, for some reason, you particularly... There was an episode which I think it might have been the last episode of the last series. It was an episode in which um, uh, Caroline Brazier, who plays my wife, who is just so... My mm. former wife, who I think mm. is such a wonderful, wonderful actress, and she, it's a moment in which she just loses it, finally. <laughs> After four seasons, she <laughs> finally says, enough, <laughs> and it's been coming and it hasn't happened and then it arrives, and I guess I, I loved that. I loved yeah. the way that she did that. I just thought it was, a, it was so great. Um, but yeah, and we had a lot of fun in the, in the messiness of the last, of the last couple of episodes of the last season in particular because of the more Im improvised mm. material. Um, we, we last saw him, Cleaver, sort of sauntering across the lawns of Parliament House. Mm. Is, is there going to be another series? Mm. <laughs> well, we, <laughs> we have to do it. No, you I mean, to. you can't sort of set up the Senate <laughs> and not... <laughs> and not follow through. <laughs> <laughs> so are you going to see him going head to head with, you know, a Pauline Hanson-esque? Oh, you'd have to hope so, wouldn't you? <laughs> I, mean, I just think, but honestly, you know, I, I often say that we're just desperately trying to keep up with real life in rape. Yeah. For people who say, you know, it has farcical elements, I say, are you kidding? I mean, <laughs> are you kidding me? Uh, so, yeah, I just think, yeah, no, we'll have fun. I, the and Canberra's really worth poking fun at too. Oh, it's great. Isn't it? It's yeah. a perfect place to have fun but with. But I also, I have a sort of, I'm the only person maybe in, in the world who, <laughs> Likes Canberra? who thinks of Canberra as, as really sort of romantic. But I, but I, I'm I a think bit, it's, I'm Canberra a bit, is my I'm Paris. I'm a bit like that. I, mean, <laughs> I wouldn't go that far. I wouldn't go that far. But I'm a bit, I went out with a musician and uh, he went to the Canberra School of Music. Oh, well, he was there you gonna go. He's going to be jazz trumpeter. Oh. And so I used to spend lots of weekends, first year of uni, trekking to Canberra mm. on the bus, um, <coughs> you know, surviving on $60 of our study or whatever, and spent setting money aside to go to Canberra to see him. And so we'd go to, you know, Marnica, because he'd play at the Hyatt or jazz gigs. And so you'd sort of move in that world. But I mean, he was living in a share house with a bunch of um, junkies. And, uh, you know, there was that side of it as well. But you know, you'd go bike riding on the... Yeah, it's just romantic, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> romantic. There, there is that element, but it, yeah. Yeah, there are, but it's just such, it doesn't have the character. Right? It does lack that kind of character that we do have in places like Mayfair. Uh, yeah, but give it a couple like of hundred years. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> <laughs> but it does. It, I, people are, do dismiss it. I do see that there yeah. are aspects of it that are yeah. really appealing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, look, I, I spent five years there as a student, well, four years there as a student, and I, I still, I still um, have very strong sentimental attachment to the place. I love it. And the cultural side of it, too. Mm. I mean, the gallery and... Mm. You, you and know, the gallery, you... and that's... <laughs> there's the gallery. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so look, you've entertained us on screen and, and stage, and uh, now you have launched your first book. Mm. What inspired the story of Artie Small? I mean, I, I, um, I, what I love about it is this kid who, if you read between lines, as an adult, you, you get it, but my son got it too, who he has been a bit of a tough existence. His mum doesn't leave the house. They're fairly poor. When he's only pair of shoes gets thrown over the power lines by the bully. Um, he has to pa he paints his feet black <laughs> because he thinks that then people will think he's got shoes on. I mean, how how he thinks that will happen? But he, so there's this sort of poignancy about mm. him as well, and mm. um, you know the kid who the teacher makes fun of, mm. um, the English teacher. Can't believe you made the English teacher <laughs> nasty. Um, you know, who sort of uses him in this context of examples of, you know, people who are naughty and, you know, don't get out of bed, you know, poor and 
So he, he cops it. What, what, where did he come from? I guess the idea, I, I mean, it, it, it was, it's really to do with the fact that there are kids who have really, really hard lives. And I suppose I was writing to their, to their world, to their plight. You know, because you, uh, you, you see, you encounter kids still uh, who have really hard lives, who've, you know, whose parents have divorced, whose parents have split up, or, you know, and, and um, it, it happens a lot. They're doing and, the weekend who, shuffle, you know, one parent to yeah, the Yeah, or a parent who's died, or, you know, mm. any, any of these things. And so, th I guess it was just about that. And I certainly knew kids like that when I was at school. Um, and... Uh, and I, I, I wanted to, I suppose I wanted to say that whatever those travails, whatever those terrible things that might be happening, that they are short-lived things, that you go through mm -hmm. it, that you come out the other side, that there is, that you, there is prosperity beyond that. So in a way, it's a kind of it's a it's a little chart, a navigational guide through kind of t a terrible plight to mm -hmm. to uh, a sunny outcome, both for Artie and mm. for his mother. Mm. Would you like to read an extract? Yeah, sure. To give people a sense of it. Sure. So, Artie, Artie, <laughs> Artie has been. Um, Artie accidentally gets kid uh, without sort of giving too many plot spoilers away. <laughs> Artie ends up getting kidnapped by uh, this gang of kind of lunatics mm. who are and um, there's one called Mary, who's called Mary by Artie and his Artie and his best friend Bumshoe. The names are hilarious. You had a lot of fun with the names. I did have fun with the names. <laughs> um, they get they get kidnapped by Mary. Mary is called Mary by the boys because he has a tattoo. It's a gigantic man with a tattoo on his head that says, "Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow <laughs> we die." So the boys just call him Mary for short. Um, so they've been kidnapped by Mary and a really scary dude called Funnelweb, um, who it turns out transpires are in the business of sort of preparing food for the terrible Mayor Grime, who only eats meat. Uh, so, yeah, this is... And it's a, his son who's the bully. His son, <clears throat> Nate Grime, is, mm. of course, the bully. Mm. Yeah. The statue. The terrified boys were dragged by Mary and Funnelweb back down the long hallway towards the grand entrance foyer. Up ahead, they could hear the noises of all the animals in cages. The boys were still tied back to back and had to shuffle in an awkward, crab-like way. Artie gazed miserably up at the passing parade of grime family ancestors, ancestors with their hard little eyes. He longed to be able to see his friend's face. Bumshoe will have an idea any second, he thought. Bumshoe always has ideas. Artie listened in growing distress as the two robbers planned the boys' grisly fate. Right. We'll clean and gut them out the back of the kitchen where we do all the bigger pets, said Mary. Then I'll do the butchering because you're not much chop with that. <laughs> Pardon the pun, <laughs> he chuckled. Yeah, all right, all right, replied Funnelweb, who sounded slightly wounded. Sorry, didn't mean to be rude, explained Mary. I just think you're much better with the smaller animals. I mean, you did a terrific job with those hamsters, for instance. <laughs> you think so? replied Funnelweb. Absolutely first rate, my friend, <laughs> said Mary. Now, I'm thinking I might do a nice French trimmed rib roast. <laughs> oh, lovely, lovely, said Funnelweb. Just lovely. And I know the boss suggested rosemary or thyme, but I'm really thinking sage will be the go. <laughs> oh, a bit risky, don't you think, Funnelweb said with a fretful note. Trust me, once he tastes it, he'll love it. It was the same with kittens and oregano. <laughs> uh, it's you had. I think you had fun with the baddies. I did have fun with the baddies. There, are, there. Are, yeah. I mean, you know, you describe Nate, who's the bully, as having frizzy hair and tiny eyes, like two bunny droppings on a in a bowl of porridge, on a bowl of porridge. 
why do we like? Why are we drawn to baddies, though? I mean, we 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 don't necessarily like them, but they're compelling in stories. Yeah. Oh, baddies are great. I mean, baddies are great. Uh, you know, and uh, and have uh, have always been great. I mean, from you know, in Shakespeare's all of Shakespeare's writing, it's it's the baddies who really shine. Um, you know, they're just they're just glorious characters. It's the Iagos and the sort of Macbeths and the Lady Macbeths and these fabulous dark, dark characters who are, and Richard the Third. I mean, just wonderfully dark characters, wonderfully dark inventions. I guess because they, you know, kids love that because mm. it's kind of an exposure to the to the scary world, the world of, of um, you know, that 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 they they love fearing. Kids mm. love fearing stuff, you know, the, the scary idea of, of, a, of a mare with tiny eyes who likes eating, who only eats meat, you know, <laughs> that's, mm. that's, that's great. Um, so it's, it's, it was fun to write and to give them all of their different characteristics. And we're all, I mean, we all are, we all have a bit, you have to be honest, we all have a bit of baddie in us, don't we? We're not all good. I don't. I mean, <laughs> I, I don't. Look, I mean, playing, what I really love is the characters with sort of complex moral dilemmas, like the Cleaver Greens, really, mm. of this world, who, you know, exist, you know, and defence lawyers really do live mm. in this really complex moral, because, I'm sorry, they always know if their client is guilty. Mm. They always know. Mm. And yet they have to go in and say, no, no, he didn't do that with those people. Mm. He didn't do that. Um, they always know. And so that's a complex moral mm. world to be in. Um, so, but those characters, are, those characters are, are great to play. What prompted you to finally sit down and, and do the book? Was there a particular, no, what, what was the trigger that got you to put your bum on the seat and write? Um, I think I ran out of options not to, in a way. It was more like, you know, there's no, no further compelling reason to not do this because <laughs> I'd had, you know, I'd been wanting to, and Matt, you know, talking about writing stuff for years, and, you know, <coughs> I mean, the sensible thing for me to do really would have been to write a play or a, you know, or a, or a, a, a film or a TV series or something. Um, but I'd always found that incredibly lonely and dull sitting down by myself. I'm very collaborative and um, that's the way that I, I like to work. Mm. And, and so I'd found it intolerable. I'd found, you know, my own company for all that time I, I hated. So you gave that a go, though? You did actually... Oh, I've tried it variously over time, yeah. And then I'd say to my writer mates, like Peter Duncan, who, mm. who does Rake, I'd say, oh, I've got this great, great idea. Um, for a t oh, get that. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you're right. It's, it's you know, it's, it's only me. Do you want me to? Do you want me to answer? <laughs> you like me to answer? <laughs> Let's do that. That'd be fun. <laughs> She's busy. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> what were we talking about? Um, <laughs> writing. Your writer mates. Oh and yeah. To, no, you I'd had this say, great idea. Yeah, I'd say. I've, look, I've had this fabulous idea, and I'd run them through it, and they're just like. Yeah, that's great. You go go and write it, you know, because <laughs> they never want to collaborate. Um, so, but then weirdly, writing a kids book, I found, I don't know, I just found it really fun, and um, and it was like, I don't know. The, the There's no rules, really. I mean, there, um, look, I shouldn't say that. There are rules. Mm. You're not going to have explicit sex mm. scenes or mm. you know swearing and things mm. like that. But in a sense, it can be wacky. It can go off on these quite yeah. imaginative tangents yeah. and, and, you're not, and you're liberated in a way, aren't you, yeah. as a writer? Yeah, yeah. I found it very liberating. And also, you know, I had, a, I had a little focus group, which was my boys, that I could read to mm. and, um, and, and they would act as kind of unpaid editorial staff. <laughs> <laughs> and they were very good. I mean, you can always tell when they're not when you're going off piste with your kid, <laughs> with kids, because they just kind of glaze over or they start fiddling with something. And, uh, so did you get some advice? Oh, you? absolutely. I mean, I cut chapters. Really? Yeah, yeah. I cut, I cut material that was not 
that I could tell. Because you have to keep It always them... has to move forward. Oh, there's God. a pace with children. Oh, yeah. Particularly this age group, you know, kind of eight plus. Yeah. There's this pace that you have to keep and, ma and maintain. Yeah. You can't stay anywhere for too long. No. And you can't get bogged down in, in detail. You can't, you know, use, use sort of um, too much literary flourish. Mm. They really not, they're not. They're no, not they up don't for that. need four paragraphs on the look of the, the sunset. No. No. <laughs> and you quickly find that out. And, and um, so, yeah, you have to get a, you know, and every chapter has to have a shepherd's hook at the end of it mm. um, to go, wow, what's, what's that? Where's that going to go? You wrote it, and you, uh, you thank um, Mona Vale Library at the back of the book, and you say, you know, what a testament to civilization. I'm actually sure there's some librarians here this morning, and they are. They do, uh, libraries are special. Were, were, were you left alone, though? I mean, I would think you couldn't write in a public place because people would be tapping you and saying, oh, you know, no, can I get a selfie? Great. And oh, no, it was great. I mean, I sort of, I just sit with my noise-cancelling headphones on and um, essentially, yeah, get get left alone it was it was it was it was beautiful libraries are really noisy now though have you noticed that yeah, i mean what happened to shush in libraries <laughs> and the worst offenders are librarians any librarians here to, <laughs> well you should be ashamed of yourself <laughs> um no look i absolutely loved it I, and i mean i mean that that it's a testament to our civilization that that's where taxpayer you know when mm. i look at mona vale library i go i'm happy to pay the taxes mm. that i pay to have um you know uh, these these kind of like totemic um parts of our civilization that we could say this is this is you know because that place is just used i mean there are there are mm. there are this women, free inter this is the thing too and maybe the internet. noisiness it comes a bit from the free internet mm. and because i i mean i'm guilty of this I, I was at the library ran into a friend of mine who was using the free internet we're having a chat she was trying to find a rental property and and then suddenly i thought oh i'm in a library I, oh yeah I, you're the people i'm talking about <laughs> you yeah I, I just forgot i mean they've yeah. become these kind of Diverse place. It's oh, a diverse so place diverse. now. It's not just go get a book and walk out. There's a, a lot of other things happening in libraries. Yeah. Which is fantastic. No, it's just the it's the it's the phone it's the mobile phone as well. Yeah, that's so true. it's a kind of guy getting a call about an ingrown toenail from his doctor. <laughs> and you hear the kind of one half of that conversation going, <laughs> Well, it seemed bad, you know, this morning. It was kind of pur it was purple. <laughs> there were it was purple bits. It was a bit scaly. Un underneath is a bit scaly, and you're like, oh. Um, so, but but you know that's the that the the, the the library is is a great institution. You know, because there's women with kids in their mm. kids groups and older people, and yeah, no, I love it. Have you? Are you? Is there going to be a second book? Yeah. Look, I'm writing other books, but but the, but probably not arty. Okay. I don't think Artie's going to make. No, it no, but uh, in terms of a children's. Oh, book, is there oh yeah. Be another yeah, yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. How do you, where do you, where do you get the ideas? Do they just come down from you know heaven and strike you? <laughs> is that, <laughs> I didn't think that's where they were coming from, <laughs> um, but maybe you're right. Maybe it is heaven. <laughs> I should thank heaven next. Thank heavens. Um, <laughs> Uh, I don't know where they come. Look, I, I, essentially the idea for Arty came because, you know, I've always loved adventure stories when I was a kid, you know. So it was the adventures. And I loved going on adventures. And I'm a big proponent of adventures and letting our kids have them, even though it's scary, you know, to let him go walking down to, you know, Newport Beach by himself. You know, it's scary. Those, you just think, eh, it'll be okay. Of course that's okay. Um, but anybody who's a parent will know those those moments are scary. But it, but they're so important. So the idea for this book came from my love, really, of of that kind of literature mm. when I was a kid. So it was the adventure books, including the Huckleberry Finns and Tom Sawyer stories. You know that sort of stuff. I've uh, previously interviewed your lovely wife about her when she's. She's published cookbooks, and we've, we've, I've chatted to her about those books, and I talked to her last year about her series, Sylvia's Table. And she said to me that um, cooking is an expression of creativity. 
that's something she said to me. And I wondered, you know, within your home and, and between you, I mean, how important is creativity in your... I mean, I know you both work creatively, mm. but in the way you look at your life and even your engagement with the kids and, and, and I suppose, outwardly too, looking out into the world. I mean, how important is creativity? Well, it's kind of everything for me, really. I mean, I, th I, I think, you know, every element of your life has to be an expression of that in some way or another, that a life in creativity is, is a, you know, is a, is a life well lived. I mean, I, 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 so I suppose um, so many areas of it is about creati creativity because, because creativity, in a sense, is just an expression of who you are. So, so it, and it, so it goes across all areas. And of course you get, you know, there's the kind of mundane as well. There's the kind of payment of bills and the sort of the blah, blah and this. And, you know, we live in an old house and bits are always falling off it. And I have to <laughs> Are you handy? Them. Yeah, yeah, I am actually. Weirdly, I, I am. Because I, I, people always seem surprised. But yeah, I have to say I'm a little bit surprised. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I actually... Um, because my dad was, you know, my dad was 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 an incredibly handy mm. man, and um, you know, from that generation, that would just kind of f fix anything, fix anything, and recraft any bit to mm. fix any bit. So I grew up watching that, and so you know, um, so I have I have acquired that, and I'm hopefully passing it on to him if I can get him off his iPad, get him off get him off that iPad for long <laughs> enough. Yeah, yeah. Where do you see, um, in terms of your acting, and uh, do you see yourself staying in Australia? I know it's a question Australian actors get asked a lot. Mm. You have worked overseas, but is home Australia? And have you made a conscious decision not to relocate to LA or London or New York? Is it, do you, are you passionate about having family here and remaining in Australia? Yes, always have been. Um, I... I love it so much, and I can't. Um, I find it very difficult. The idea of forsaking it to go and do something for the sake of career alone is all but intolerable. I mean, it's conceivable that you could, you know, go for little periods of time, but to go and live in 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 Hollywood is is not something I could I could ever do. I mean, I I just I think that the life that we have here is so. Wonderful, and we're incredibly lucky. I just mm. think we are incredibly lucky here um, in so many ways. And, um, and I love it. I love it for my family. You've had a, um, talking about acting and Australian actors, you've had a roll call of amazing actors on Rake. I mean, mm. all of the best. Jacqueline McKenzie, I mean, it goes on. The list is extraordinary. Sasha Haller, Kate Blanchett. Uh, is there a sense um, of camaraderie be between Australian actors? I mean, you, you get that sense as an outsider. Is it like that? Is there a friendliness among Australian actors? Yeah, well, there's so many, uh, you know, because it's a, it's a sort of little chamber industry, so you do know so many people and so many of them you've worked with before. I mean, a lot in the company of the present alone, there were so many of us. That The present was the name of the, the Chekhov that we just finished in New York. And... And it was a company of actors, who, and so many of the permutations of who had worked with whom over time, mm. um, it gives it a great family quality. And, you know, old relationships, like I've done so many things with Kate over the years, mm. so many... so many. You're good friends, aren't you? Yeah, we're, we're good friends. And I just love, I mean, I obviously love working with her because she's brilliant, but mm. she's also just such a great human being. And um, so to... And to have the longevity of looking back over time and, uh, and saying, well, you know, she was my Ophelia and mm. now here we are playing these kind of... And thank God he met Lizzie. Yeah, yeah. So, mm. uh, and, you know, now we're playing these people having midlife crises. And, you know, it's <laughs> great. And then I guess we'll be kind of, um, you know... In your dotage. <laughs> yeah, <You'll be> <laughs> that's right. Do you think about the longevity of it, though? I mean, do you... Th you know, do you see yourself acting until oh, God, there won't be yeah. a sort of a retirement date? You won't be, oh. you know, getting your super at 65 and <laughs> no. kicking back and no. cruising the world? I'm about to have a baby daughter in two weeks' time. <laughs> I can't, I have, I'm going to be working until I'm, 80. until I drop. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. How does that feel, thinking you're going to have a daughter after two boys? It's oh, happened to great. me. I've got two boys and a daughter. Oh, do you? Oh. And I, it'll probably be prepared for Sylvia to just go crazy. I adore, I adore, and you know, one of my sons, you've met my oldest son, he's yeah. present, it's okay, yeah. he understands. Yeah. There is something about having a daughter. And yeah. people used to say it to me, and I, yeah, 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 but I love my boys. Yeah. But I don't know, there's, and as a mother, there, as another female, there's something incredibly powerful about that relationship. Mm. I can't even conceptualise it as in the way that you can't before a before a you baby arrives. You can't conceptualise any of it, can you? No. Having a child before having a child or being no. a parent. And, and being a father of a daughter. I mean, I've got no idea what to do. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> no clue whatsoever, you know, unicorns and rainbows. And who knows what? Get ready for... It doesn't matter how you... I'm not into that. I'm not into... I'm not crafty. No. I'm not... No. I'm not girly, girly, tutu no. I mean, look, I, I wear pants most of the time. And she yeah. says to me... Why don't you ever wear dresses? <laughs> and it's, I always say, well, because we had a motorbike until yeah. recently. My husband had an accident. So it's because of the motorbike. I couldn't wear dresses on the motorbike. So I'd say that. But, you know, she'll look at me as though, uh, you know, why don't you could, dress could up? Could try harder. We're, we're, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It is. And, but she, you know, she's six. She's six yeah. years old. Yeah. I've, not, I've not dressed her since she was eight, from 18 months. Oh, wow. She chooses her clothes. And right. I recently chose them before the school disco last yeah. week. Yeah. I was deliriously tired leading up to the festival, and I just plucked, first time I've ever chosen clothes, plucked something out of her drawers. She cried at school for one hour. <laughs> I'm not wearing that. Please take me home. And it, it was fine, but see, she hadn't chosen it. It wasn't... It wasn't her. No, but, but creative and energetic and right. just... It, it, having a daughter is amazing. You're going to love it. Yeah, you didn't sell it, it all that well. You're going to love it. Uh, just in, yeah, the crying for an hour at school thing. But... <laughs> Um, no, I, it will be, uh, it'll be amazing. And of course, Sylvia is terribly excited about oh, it because it's a girl, you know, yeah. and so she's sort of thinking girl things and I'm saying, you know we're going to have a Bunnings lesbian girl. <laughs> and she'll be like, come on, Dad, sausage sizzle up there. Saturday, let's go, boys. <laughs> so funny. You know that's what's going to happen. That's what, <laughs> that's what God's got in store there. <laughs> She'll be helping you do all the handiwork on Absolutely, the house. Absolutely, it'd be great. <laughs> We've got about 12 minutes till we finish up. There's some microphones down the front here. If you would like to ask a question of Richard, uh, please feel free to come down to the microphones. I'll keep chatting if you don't have any questions, but I'm sure you do. If you have a m mobility issues, just throw your hand up and we'll, one of the volunteers will bring a microphone down to you. So if you want to have a... Think of a question, you can start heading to the microphone, and um, but otherwise, I'll keep chatting. <laughs> What's the response been like to the book? Have you, have you been... Oh, it's uh, been great. I mean, I got, I got sent this... There's a, a school in WA where there's a, obviously a very sort of um, enthusiastic librarian who, who has read the book to all the kids, and they had to write review. They all wrote a review of it. <laughs> and they all sent me that. So she sent me this wad of reviews. reviews. <laughs> and I just, it was so moving. It was so beautiful to receive, like, this kind of wad of, of all these kids' thoughts on the book. I just loved it. What, what really surprised me was the number of kids who responded so strongly to the mother character. Because mm. there's a kind of broken mm. mother character in the book who, um, you know, is, she's a woman in a lot of trouble. And you realise from, from through, the ad, through adult eyes that she's obviously in some sort of, you know, terrible agoraphobic uh, depression of some sort. And, um, of course, the events as they're unfurling end up bringing her out of this terrible sort of cocoon condition as well. And she comes roaring out. And it's a great sort of victorious moment. And, but it really surprised me how the, the way that kids really responded mm. to that. Really seemed to strike a chord with so many kids. They loved the moment when she came out uh, with golf clubs. Mm. <laughs> the hero. Yeah, the she's, 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 like hero. she's very much the heroic mm. character in the story. So. What do you think it is, um, uh, you know, that, th that quality that children have what, what is it that we lose when we, come at, we become adults, do you think? 
you know, that, that when we transition from childhood to, and which you're probably tapping back into that yes. childhood space. And Michael Lunig talked about this last night, wanting to yeah. just be that, the, the child. Uh, what do you think we lose as we become adults? There's a kind of, just a kind of enthusiasm, a zest, a kind of open-eyed ability to see the magic in stuff mm. that I adore in kids. And, um, and I guess you miss it and you suddenly realise, oh, God, I just heard myself say that. Am I really just an old fart now? <laughs> I mean, uh, did I just say that? That's really boring. And mm. so it's trying to make sure that you don't, you know, that that doesn't happen to you. And it doesn't have to happen. Mm. I mean, uh, you know, you, you, meet, you meet, you know, elderly people who still have that, who still have that spark. It's keeping that stuff alive. It's a vitality, somehow. isn't it? And and yeah. it's and it's un, unself conscious mm. too. Mm. You know, I think don't you know? Don't you think as we become adults, we're always the, when Michael talked about this last that that voice that says, "Oh, don't do that. Oh no, yeah. that's the wrong." You know, yeah. and he talked about having the two voices and the child voice that says, "Do it. Yeah, do it. Yeah. Just be. <laughs> you know, stuff the you know the harsh voice. Just do it. Yeah, have fun." Have yes. fun. Yeah, have fun. Mm. That's a great, I mean, that's a great sort of mantra life because I think that that does keep, keep stuff alive. <laughs> but you're right, writing, writing this book has been such a, such a kind of adventure in refined it for me in, in reattaching myself to that, to that, to a sense of that, you know, the child within, you know, mm. I, I guess, because you have to see the world through through kids' eyes, you have to imagine that you're, you know, you're a kid being led backwards down a corridor by two scary guys to, to, your, to your imminent doom. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's keeping, that, keeping that stuff alive. Mm. It's such an important thing. And we can get so enmeshed and entrapped by the daily pressure and the, the, the garbage of life, the, mm. the stuff that's not really what life's about. Um, because I agree with Michael, it's about listening to the other voice that just says, just go, mm. just do it. Mm. What the hell? Life is very brief, you know, I mm. think it's... Too brief. It whistles by. And so, um, yeah. I think we have a question here. I just wanted to say I love your work and um, I'm very interested in reading your children's book, which um, I didn't think... I'd be interested in, but it sounds <laughs> <laughs> very exciting. <laughs> Not, you know, because it's a kids' book, I guess. Um, just wondered whether you had uh, any been involved in any mentoring um, programs for young actors. I have. Whether you'd be willing to be a mentor? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I actually, I, I actually love the idea of working with young actors. Um, uh, but I haven't been involved in any sort of mentoring. Um, work as such, but I, I, I guess the, the 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 longer you get into what you do, and the further down the track you get, you start to think about that as as a as a good thing to do. I had a very difficult time when I was at drama school. We, uh, my year at NIDA, decided to start a, a revolution, um, <laughs> and so. It was a highly politicised, highly charged and very controversial time and we were told at one point, you will not be a graduating year from this school. So my relationship to the whole thing of, of um, you know, being an acting student, I think has been, I, I sort of ran from the wreckage of that environment and only darkened their doorway for the first time last year since I left drama school. Um, because it's a very changed institution now. So the idea of going back and talking to, you know, students now is very, very interesting to me, very appealing to me. Why, do you have something in mind? Well, <laughs> <laughs> well I do. Since you said life is short and you should take opportunities, I would like to give mm. you <laughs> Oh. And if, if you've got five minutes, not to read it now, just something if you've got you prepared five. earlier. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and just after listening to the, your conversation today and your interview, I think, uh, yeah, I think you might.
find you what I've written interesting. But, um, yeah, I just thought I'd take a chance and good. Uh, take the opportunity. And, yeah. Um, yes, yeah, good. Really enjoy, enjoy your interview. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have a <coughs> question down the, in the middle there. Yeah. Hi. Hi, Richard. Uh, I was just interested in your family I background. can't see no, where I, you are. I'm just Sorry. see in that middle aisle there. So I'll come down. Oh, Why yeah. did you put your hand up then? <laughs> that was really confusing. I'm here. No, you're not. <laughs> ah, here we go. Oh, We've here you are. Lights, yeah. Hello. <laughs> you're right. I was just interested in your family description with uh, your five scientist siblings mm. and then you. Do you think that's the ratio that we need? We need. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> So it takes uh, five scientists to create the environment <laughs> for a creative person to come into the world. And I think that's probably a really healthy, healthy <laughs> ratio. Um, I, I probably, uh, having said that, I'm probably doing a couple of my siblings a disservice by just ascribing them the, the, the name scientist. So because my sister is, one of my sisters is now a landscape architect. And so I don't know if that, is that a scientist? So. But my, I guess so by it's that, a bit creative, it's, really. yeah, it's, it is quite, quite a lot more creative. And in fact, quite a lot of them are also very creative. So, um, but yes, it's probably, it's probably quite a healthy, and no politician. <laughs> no politicians at all. What about lawyers? Yeah, no, not a lawyer in sight. <laughs> <laughs> and just, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, Asked by one of our local medical scientists. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you know that. Thank you. Um, the, the name Charles Water Street uh, is known to Rosemary. Her brother painted the Archibald Prize winning portrait. And he's a writer, obviously, and a columnist. Is it true that your character in Rake is also perhaps based loosely on Charles Water Street? No, it's a great myth. Um, <laughs> it's a great myth that has been uh, hotly propagated by Charles Water Street. <laughs> Who's, who's, <coughs> whose social media handle is the real, real rake? Yes. <laughs> no, Charles We were is, talking uh, about Charles, weren't we? Yes, we were no. talking about Charles. Um, no, Charles is a lawyer who I knew in Sydney, um, and uh, he told us a story, because when we knew we were going to do a story about a lawyer, um, we went and saw him because I knew him, and... So we saw Charles and said, because we knew he was a kind of font of kind of tales and interesting, you know, chit chat. And so we saw him and he told us a story which we ended up using in the first season of Rake, which was a very good story, a very fun story um, for those who have seen it. It's the story involving the dog and the doctor. <laughs> and that's all I'll say. Um, <laughs> and... Um, uh, it was a very good story, and it was based on a, on a true thing, believe it or not. Uh, and um, so then we thought, well, he's told us this story, and we're going to use it, so how do we credit him now? And we at that stage thought, well, Rake will go for us maybe a season, maybe two seasons. Or something. So we said, look, we'll just call him a co-creator. And so we gave Charles, we, had to, you know, we, we gave him that credit. That was the mistake you made. Uh, yes, it was a terrible mistake, as it turns mm. out, because Charles has had Charles has nothing to do with it apart from that, and yet he still says, you know, he's still his Twitter handle is that right? Real rake is the real well, rake on Instagram so. before he got pushed off it with that kerfuffle. Like, you know, he was representing Rogerson, and then he put something on Instagram and oh, it compromised yes. the whole. So the trial had to be aborted. Yes. And, uh, but that was his, uh, yes. No, he's sort of out Cleaver's Cleaver. He I mean, does, Cleaver, <laughs> Cleaver. <was> Cleaver. <laughs> uh, I just heard the town hall clock um, timing. We'll quick question here and we'll finish up. Good morning, Richard. Uh, just on behalf of Newcastle, I'd like to say uh, thank you very much for popping down to our little old town and uh, having a good chat with us. Um, it's been a kind of personal dream for me to exchange words with you, so I'll just tick that one off. <laughs> off the list. Uh, the next one's Kevin Spacey, so I'll just go... Um, yeah, if anyone knows where he lives. Um, the one serious question that I've got, and I'm sure it's burning in the back of everyone's minds, is where do you get the red dressing gown that you wear oh, on set? Oh, don't because you love it? I have been searching high <laughs> and low. I, 
I've tried to get, uh, you know, imitations and I've gone to, you know, like Hugh Hefner kind of Playboy style, but I really just want to get the real deal. Yeah, so no, it's, you, it's good, yeah, isn't if it? If you can, like, you know, just get my address and then just <laughs> mail it to me or, or, so, or just, you know, direct me to an online store, that'd be, a, that'd be much appreciated. I don't think... I mean, I, I know we went through... We, we had dozens and dozens and none of them were right and then we found that and I just... Mm slipped into that and it was yeah. just gold. I mean, especially with the sort of just, just nothing underneath, but um, some brogues yeah. on the feet. I mean, and was then... Was it, did it come from the costume department or like... Yeah, did you, well, no, yeah. that was my, it was my idea that, because he lives above a, a coffee shop. Yeah. And so the idea that he would just come down, basically, if he could possibly have come down in the nude, that would have been ideal. <laughs> But just to slip into that and mm. come down and have his breakfast in the mornings was, was great. But yeah, I do love it. Um, and they lost it for a while in between one season and the next, and that was a terrifying mm. moment in time. But we found it again. But in the meantime, what's happened is, um, you know, because I, I liked the look, you know, just brogues and bare legs because it looks so ridiculous. <laughs> And then what's happened is, if you look at any catwalk photos <laughs> from the last five years, all, all these sort of male models just kind of in brogues <laughs> and bare legs, like shorts, you know, and brogues. And you, so it's you're really... You're a trendsetter. Yeah, that's Cleaver's right. Cleaver's a trendsetter. They, that's right. Just add that one to your resume. <laughs> yes, that's right. I'm going for the, yeah, the dressing gown and uh, absolutely nothing on. And underneath at my local cafe, so yeah, I just need to heighten my wardrobe with that, and that'd be great. <laughs> That's right. Thank you, mate. Thanks. Cheers. Pleasure. <laughs> Thank you. We have to uh, finish up now. I have to race off and host another session. Richard is going to... He, he can't sign books immediately after this session because he's got to go and participate in our Family Day event here in Wheeler Place. But at 12.15, he'll be finished, and he'll be signing books. If you are around at 12.15... Richard will happily sign books. You can get Artie in the Grime Wave in the bookstore. Join me in thanking Richard. Thank you.